I need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI and Traction. Today's Traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Growth Blazers. I'm tuning in from Dubai and our awesome guest here, Vishal, is tuning in from around Boston. So really, really excited today. Link Squares has grown a thousand percent in two years. 500 plus brands, including Fitbit and Twilio as customers, has raised more than 160 million in funding. And the company was recently placed number 253 on the annual Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing private companies in North America. And excited here to have Vishal because they're coming off a Series C announcement just two days ago, a $100 million Series C. And what a rush, all of this in two years, zero to 10 million ARR, 160 plus million in funding all in two years. What a rush. And Vishal's going to share all about their challenges, lessons, triumphs, failures along the way. Welcome to Traction, Vishal. How, how are you doing? Hey, Lloyd. Thanks for having me. Doing great today. Awesome. And there's, there's, <laughs> I see here, Matthew here has tuned in from Dubai. So we, we have a pretty international audience, usually people from Berlin to Dubai to Vancouver to Los Angeles tuning in. So hopefully you get more and more people uh, chime in here. Plan B Capital Group. Awesome. So you've had a great career, right? Before Link Squares, you ran operations and product management on high growth tax companies like Backupify, which was acquired by Dato, Inside Square. What made you decide to start Link Squares? What else did you consider? Yeah, so... My dad is an entrepreneur when I was growing up, and and I kind of kind of grew up watching watching him grow a company like from the, literally the basement of our house to a couple hundred employees. And so, as I as I kind of you know academically studied engineering like my dad, and 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 fell in love with the problem solving, I I just said to myself, let me keep my mind open on interesting ideas, right? And I actually job changed into SaaS, right? I wasn't like a SaaS person and an operator my entire life. I was actually building hardware for the military right out of undergrad uh, as an engineer. And then from there, yeah, taking the ride at Backupify and kind of seeing what the problems were uh, specifically around uh, the contracts we were being asked to review during the acquisition. That was like a, a moment where I could have not done it, but I thought it was interesting enough. And I, I paired up with this really great co-founder Chris, Chris Combs, and and he had kind of had that entrepreneurial itch and he had started a couple companies too. And so it felt like something worth pursuing, right? It felt like a big business problem and, and something worth pursuing. And we, we actually started really humbly uh, in the back of a coffee shop Wednesday nights and Sundays when the Patriots, New England Patriots are not playing. Uh, and and we kind of start, we started from there just kind of exploring things. Fantastic. What a story. And, and how did you meet your co-founder? What is the story that you guys worked together in the past? Yeah. Yeah. At Backupify. So uh, Chris had joined the company. Uh, we kind of had the desks near each other in kind of the layout of the office. And he was like a huge, huge sports fan. Same with me. And, and uh, one day I was like, hey, man, you want to go to this Patriots game? I got like an extra ticket. Like you know, we had kind of you know, become more friendly over the time we had worked next to each other and it kind of just went from there. And, and then I kind of learned a lot more about Chris and how he had like this great entrepreneurial spirit and background and kind of had, had some of that playbook that I didn't really have on how do you get something off the ground from literally nothing. And, and Chris is such a master expert at that. So yeah, it's just kind of two guys just kind of thinking through a problem space, meeting up and, and going from there. You know, building a company with a co-founder is one of the most satisfying things to do, but it's hard to find co-founders. What are your top two or three things you look for in that sort of founder, founder fit, let's call it, right? One is what I sensed was you guys fill each other's gaps, but what are some other things that you guys came to align on to start this company? Yeah, like when when we actually went full time and that was full time, that was like, you know, January 2016. It's just like a clear separation of like who's doing what, right? I had the engineering background. Obviously, I took the build of our kind of initial prototypes and software and 
and kind of the management of that. Chris had more like a sales account management background. So you're not wrong. We did kind of join together really easily and, and the puzzle pieces fit. I think the other thing is we were kind of in the same kind of spot in our lives, like personally. And so much of the journey comes from, from like personal, uh, the personal interactions that you have, right? Like we both were unmarried. We didn't have kids. We kind of had the time to devote to it. And that, you know, there wasn't anyone who was more busy than, than someone else out of the two of us. We kind of made that commitment together. And, you know, we, we ended up marrying both of, you know, we mar- married our girlfriends that have been with us for forever, right? Christina and my wife, Shalini. And, and uh, then we had kids kind of at the same time, you know, we both had little girls and it's been wild to kind of see us kind of do the journey together. And some of that's so important because, you know, there's the personal burn rate at home. Like, you know, are you in a place, you know, financially to maybe not get paid for a couple of years and, and really kind of devote all your time and effort to this and kind of stay alive. So those are like really important things and, and really great yeah. and important things that, that we just, it just kind of came together naturally. Both uh, the emotional, personal side of it aligning values and then also business side of it, filling each other's gaps. I love it. Describe to us what Link Squares does in one sentence. Yeah, it's legal technology, it's contract management, and uh, we're a category leader now in contract management. So legal teams are our buyers. They use us both to assemble contracts to be signed and then store their contracts in our uh, post-signature, like purpose-built repository. And and we read these contracts with artificial intelligence and tell people what's inside it because that's a really time-consuming, cumbersome, difficult thing to get access to that data. I mean, essentially we're a, a data creation company. Well, as you were thinking through ideas, how did you know this was it? Did you think through other ideas with, with your co-founder? We, we had a kind of initial hypothesis with the Backupify acquisition that why did we not know what was in the contracts when we were asked by data who's buying the company, right? And then that's not enough to like quit your job and uproot your whole lifestyle and and start kind of going down the path of being a founder. But we started talking to a lot of just teams and people, you know, Boston is such a vibrant and rich ecosystem for amazing companies. And so as we kind of worked our way through meeting more people, learning more things, there were some really interesting insights about contract management. Like it's a 20 year old industry. And a lot of the vendors in the space had focused on what we call like pre-signature workflows like the process to get a a contract from first draft negotiated and signed. Right. But our problem space started way differently, which is, you know, we were focused on contracts that were already executed. Like we needed answers to contracts that had already been executed. And so we, we started on a different side of it. Right. And, and when we looked at kind of, the basic building blocks of, of a business. It's like, well, yeah, are we going to be able to find customers? Yeah. Every single business in the entire planet has contracts. I don't care what your business model is. You have it. Right. And, and that's good. So that means there's a large market. There was, there was obviously challenges with the perception of it being very crowded. Right. And, and then how do we differentiate ourselves and, and kind of go from there. But you know, we kind of honed in on it, you know, really, really quickly and kind of stayed true to like our North Star there, you know, even from the most early days. And how did, how did you go about early customer development? How did you find people to validate you and this, this could be a thing? How did you get your first customers? Enough of our kind of mentors kind of nudged us towards like the general counsel as a role inside of a company. And Chris and I knew exactly zero general counsels. It, the startup that I worked at didn't have one. We, we were not kind of at that scale. Uh, we, we didn't have a general counsel. So uh, we went and we bought 25,000 emails from a really great company who mined them off LinkedIn for us. We paid, I don't know, 25 cents a record. And I bought one license to Tout App. You know, shout out TK, right? Uh, but one, we one had license. TK on the show a couple of times. We had TK. On the show a couple <laughs> I've been on times. his. I've been on his Scotch show. That was, that was great. Um, we bought one license to Tout App, and 
wrote some cold emails and just started dripping general counsels and just kind of, Hey, I'm Vishal. You don't know me. I worked at a tech company that looks just like yours. Uh, I think you have this problem around contracts and do you want to chat? Like you got 20 minutes. You want to just chat? I'd just love to learn about how you, how you will work and what your challenges are. That's how we got started. And we didn't build a massive web application and dump like hundreds of thousands of dollars into it. We actually built a clickable prototype, like on the cheap. You know, it was a Rails app. It didn't have any interactivity, limited amount of buttons actually worked. And that kind of clickable prototype enabled us to kind of, you know, get into a demonstration and ask a bunch of questions and let people interact with us about it. And we kind of made a rule that we were not going to go full-blown product development, even though I'm such a builder and, and like a very impatient person anyways, like by my personality that we weren't going to build anything until we talked to a hundred general counsels. And like, we knew them inside and out. We know what they do every day. We know what their problems are. And that took a long time. That took like a year. And eventually like it started changing from like discovery into like sales. And they're like, well, you know, can I, can I try it? And I'm like, no, what the, dude, this is like, this is a prototype. Like this, I don't have anything for you to try, but it gave us enough confidence to be like, okay, well, maybe we can put a little dough into the actual development process and then kind of, you know, keep building from there, but going much more like there's a problem and I'm going to talk to a customer before we get to a solution. And that was really some of the magic sauce that, that Chris had as a, as a founder, a very special talent that he has to just kind of stay the course. It was a long year. You know, many days of like being like, what are we doing, man? Like, what, why, like, what are we doing right now? But, but yeah, I look, I look back now, I laugh. And, and those are the formative years for sure. I love it. Not many people talk about this. You got 25,000 emails of GCs, general counsels, your ideal customer profile, loaded up in Tout App, started emailing them and saying, you know, I'm an entrepreneur trying to solve this problem, not looking to sell you anything. Could we hop on a call for some advice, feedback? And, and they hopped on the call with you. And then eventually it turned into sort of a sales, the classic, like, you know, sell shit and then build it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, I'll because... tell you, the first, one of the first weeks we ran the drips, like we had like unicorn tech company, general counsels replying back to us. And it was so funny. We were like, we made it like that. We made it, bro. Like this is taking off and man, how far away we were from getting them to sign order forms. But it, it created that momentum. And then just, you know, every week, just keep on getting a little better, learn a little bit more, track it all, meticulous I, I, tracking. Definitely. I, I love this because not many people talk about it, right? How did you figure out what's the minimum viable product to build? Like, were you hearing the same thing over and over again? How do you figure out, like, what's that one feature set that's going to be the aha moment or the, or the wow, the, the deliverer of wow? It's, it's understanding the pain point before you build the, the software, right? You got to understand the why. You got to understand why people are suffering. In our case, people were suffering that like, we've got all these contracts. Some of them are on our paper. Some of them are negotiated on our paper. I mean, they're like redlined and changed. Third party paper, which it's not your contract template. You're a lot less familiar with it. It can range in kind of any, kind of any flavor and size. It could be three pages. It could be 75 pages. And so we started with like, okay, we know we have to be a repository. So like, you know, a cloud-based repository, you can upload the files to and then the big problem we ran into was the digitization of scanned PDFs. You'd be shocked at the uh, sophisticated public tech companies that we work with today, even where like 80, 90% of their historical files are all scanned PDFs. So we had to like overcome that challenge. If we could get the text of the scanned PDF, the first thing we built was a little search engine. You could just type in a word and a phrase and mine like you're looking for a termination for convenience, which is like a really terrible thing that if SaaS companies do, it impacts your like revenue recognition. A lot of people don't like doing it and they shouldn't. So you could just put in like termination for convenience and hit enter and see all the results of that phrase and where it exists. We got started with like a little search tool. Then eventually people were like, I like the search, don't get me wrong, but you know, what, couldn't you just tell me what is inside the contract with me not having to type it in like Google? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool. I mean, that's machine learning, right? That's NLP, natural language processing. 
And, you know, putting on, then I put on my engineer hat and I just started reading about NLP theory, how it works and how do you build these systems? And one of my early employees, one of his best friends was um, an associate professor at MIT's uh, NLP laboratory. Like you can't even make this up, like the most ideal person to ask questions to. So we invited him over for pizza and beers to the office, the little office we had. And he, he kind of gave us the early playbook on like, well, you need data and then you need a, a labeling system. You need a way to annotate it, to train the algorithm. And then here's some theory on how to build the algorithm. And we just, you know, kept going. And the AI journey is itself, you know, an incredible topic, but it's just not giving up trying to just comb your network, like who I will call, like li literally Lloyd still to this day, I will cold email the president of the United States. Like I have no filter on, I will cold email anyone. Like that's it. We just cold email a bunch of people constantly. I still do. So, you know, you know, what's funny is I hear that from, from sort of business facing founders a lot. It's very rare to hear that from like a technical uh, genius, a technical facing founder. Right. And so that's that's great. So it just tells me that your DNA in the company is built on customer first foundation of, of selling and, and customers. And if you build a product that customers love and want to pay for, the money will follow. At what point did you raise your first external capital? Yeah, so we did a we did a um, a little accelerator program in in Atlanta run by a really great uh, founder. His name was Chris Kloss. And so he gave us a hundred thousand dollars. We put it on a safe. That was the first money we ever took. Uh, kind of, you know, like high net worth individual kind of accelerator. Um, so we did that for a summer for like a couple weeks. And then I came back and I said, well, let's build on that. And, you know, we had a couple customers paying us and I did a 500 K angel round. And that was all kind of in Boston, you know, founders combed my network. I worked at one company and, Backupify, and I obviously went to the founder of Backupify. I was like, yo, man, you, you got to give me something, right? And just kind of put the stamp on it that you got my back on, that you got me and Chris back on this, right? And he was like, yeah, no problem. Uh, and then kind of went from there. And I said, well, Rob, Rob is his name, Rob May. I said, well, who do you know? And he's like, man, I know everyone. And I was like, well, could, could you like, you know, give me some more intros and kind of just kept going, just kept on asking, like found another angel investor, like who else do you know, right? And then we hit a vein of like five kind of buddies at a public tech company in the local Boston area. And they all threw in, right? And that kind of like built momentum on the round, got some of my family and my friends and family in, you know, I was like, hey, listen, this might be terrible. It would be a really awkward Thanksgiving if I lose all this, but I think, you know, we're on to something. And it just kind of- all made money. There. They've all made <laughs> money. Now they have, oh, for sure. Yeah, 500K. Love it, love it. 500K, that was 2017. And then the next year we did our real first institutional seed round. And um, 2018, you know, Hyperplane gave us the term sheet, local AI fund in Boston, who had been tracking us for years and kind of had the relationship and, you know, basically told them I was going to get to a million at ARR and I was going to raise this capital a million at ARR. And he was like, okay, yeah, well, we'll see you, you know, we'll see when you're ready. And you're a little too early for us in the years before, but then I showed up and I was like, hey, John Murphy, I'm at like 750K ARR, everything I told you. And then uh, we were so thankful to have Hyperplane give us a term sheet. Actually, the day my daughter was born, my first daughter, Alicia, the day she was born, John emailed me the term sheet and, and it was like a crazy day. Like that was an awesome day. I'll never forget that. That's amazing. So you, you got the product market fit on like five, 600K, like pretty much. Right. Very, very yeah. lean. Yeah. It's super lean. Like, you know, probably too lean in engineering. Like we just didn't have the money. Like we had some hypothesis about the AI, but we were nowhere near the level of sophistication that we have now. We didn't have a lot of cash. So, you know, the, the AI journey for us means you need PhDs, you know, NLP scientists, you know, machine learning engineers, AWS infrastructure experts, right, to kind of build all this stuff scalably. But then after we got that seed cash, like we really had enough. We, we raised 4.8 million bucks and we hired an amazing uh, first PhD, Gav, and uh, uh, our first machine learning engineer, Kiran. And then under the guidance of then my CTO, Eric, who's still here, right, and kicking around and doing great. 
we kind of pieced together the strategy, how we were going to build this thing for real, right? Yeah, totally sell it before it's real, you know, kind of keep learning on it. Wow. At what point you knew that you found product market fit? What were the signals? Hmm. Yeah, it's a term a lot of people use, right? Like, what does it mean? Right? Like, what does product market fit mean? I think about it, you know, a lot like under the tutelage of Jason Lemkin's famous blog post on like, you know, initial traction is like 10 people who didn't do you a favor. You don't know them. You couldn't pick them out of, out of a group of strangers, right? That 10 people, right? Like, like 10, we got 10 customers and then we got 25 kind of the next year. And we started to see kind of conversion rates just slightly start to get better. Like it's getting just a little bit easier the next time and a little bit easier the next time. Right. And then kind of, as we cruised towards a million ARR, my CRO, Steve, you know, had joined at about, you know, I'd say 600 K 650 K. And that's when I kind of convinced him, like, I, I think we have something, we have 50 customers and like seven people who work in the company, man. Like, and it's absurd. It was just like absurd. It was like insanity. Like we were working a million hours every day, just trying to keep everything afloat. Um, it was then when I kind of realized that Steve could, you know, Steve could hire some some new reps in addition to like our first employee who had who has been had, you know kind of been doing really well at selling it, and then to scale it, repeat it. Like take Lyle, my first employee, and copy and paste him four or five times and train them up to sell the way that. Lyle did. And once that happened and, you know, then we did a one to 4 million ride, you know, in that year in 2019, it was wild. You know, we did a one to 4 million ARR run and that's when I knew for sure. You know, and the thing was, thing was working. It was definitely working. We had, we had fit, you know, we had a buyer that understood what we were selling and was ready to buy it. And that's, that's when the flywheel really started kicking up. Definitely. Now you, you made this beautiful bridge, right? From like, Hey, I'm getting validation. Give me feedback. Uh, trying to figure out what the MVP is to then eventually went into selling. And I loved what you said there is as you were trying to get validation and, and get customer feedback and build that first minimum viable product, people are asking you, can I pay for this? Give it to me. And that's, that's a great sign of validation. And then now you have paying customers and they're renewing and they're staying and they're engaging in your product. And, and that's a great sign of product market fit. But in those early days, did you have like a no go or go time frame to drop this idea and work on something else? No, we burned the ships, right? We, we <laughs> sailed across to a distant land. We burned the ships and, and I really never looked back now in my, in my heart. It was like, well, if this thing fails, like I live in a great technology ecosystem, I'm sure I can get another job if, if absolutely needed, right? But let's just keep going at it. The hardest year was the development year. When we started selling it, things got really exciting. Like I was, I learned how to become like a sales engineer. Like, and I had never been like a sales engineer, right? I learned how to do a great demo and answer questions on the fly and then you know, build all the, all the security stuff that we needed and know the security piece cold because you know, we're become a system of record of sensitive data. And, and I never thought it wouldn't make it, you know, once we made it to a million at ARR, I was like, so focused on getting to 10 million, like, and if we can get to 10 million in a, in a quick pace with some more cash and keep scaling this thing, we can keep doing this forever. Right? Like $12,000. That was our first deal ever. And then you cross a million and it's like, oh my God, this is insane. It's just incredible. And then from there, it's like, if you want to be the best, it's 10 million in two years. So what do we need to do? How many more people do we need to hire? How many more reps do we need? Like, what do we need to do on the product that's holding us back? Integrations, whatever. Just kind of go from there. I never thought it would fail. Uh, my wife reminds me that I, you know, my wife reminds me that, that uh, I had moments of doubt, but but I never really wanted to eject. I, I thought this was going to take off and it did. So, Fantastic. I love, I love the resolve there. Now, in the early days, you're cold emailing people, 25,000 email lists. You got some great conversions. 
How did that evolve past 1 million, right? Because you probably needed like 50, 60 customers to get to 1 million ARR. Is that about right? Or mm, Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. And so then to get from 1 million to 10 million, what were some key things you did to make that journey? Yeah, so... I had a lot of knowledge of B2B SaaS marketing because my, my run at Backupify did a lot of operations work inside the, uh, the marketing team. And so uh, I knew that there were just channels that were just not going to be efficient for us, like pay-per-click advertising, like maybe less than 1% kind of conversion rate there. You know, if we don't have a lot of money, it's probably not spending $25,000 a month on pay-per-click advertising or you know, content syndication, like cost per lead programs probably weren't the right fit for us because it's just too expensive and we're not going to get the return as fast as we want. So we kept cold emailing and then we, we started researching who and where our buyers hang out. Like what is the, what is the equivalent of Dreamforce for the general councils, right? And there were two events that go on annually. Uh, we still sponsor them every year. I mean, we attend and we're a big part of it. Uh, there's a corporate legal operations show, and then there's the Association of Corporate Counsel. And so it made it, it was pretty clear that those two events had the best kind of turnout and the best pull and the best draw. And we sponsored it. We had a really, really small booth at a uh, corporate legal ops conference clock show in Vegas. We flew out there, just the three of us, manning the booth for 12 hours. We begin to realize that like trade shows are actually a phenomenal channel for us. Like we spend a dollar. I think the first time we ever did it, we brought six dollars home at ARR on a dollar of spend. Right. That was like the ratio. It was like off the charts. I was like, this is awesome. Like, and so then we did another event. And so we kind of like started mixing like cold email and then in-person events, right? And then there was another great community, tech general counsel, tech GC run out of New York and San Fran. You know, they were excited about us kind of being the new kids on the block, you know, five, six people in the company. And so they get, it got us to a bunch of events for free. We're really thankful for them, you know, in the early days. But it was about where are our buyers hanging out? Where can we get access to these general counsels? You know, general counsels are, are just, um, you know, they're not like blog post readers, right? They're not like marketing nerds, right? Marketing tech nerds where they're always, you know, looking for that trick that can get you 2% more click-through rate on an email or something like, you know, they're, they're, they're advanced degrees. They're usually, you know, older, you know, o- older in age. So, you know, they don't hunt eBooks and blog posts, you know, exclusively. So we kind of had to work the strategy to them, right? If, if I could get in a room full of 10, 15 general counsels, I was all for it, right? We would do anything to do that. And I know I just had to bring one deal home, $20,000 deal. $25,000 commits one person to buy, pay for the whole thing, right? We still run that hustle. Like we still run that kind of hustle mentality. Like bring home, bring home the deals that are going to pay for this event. <laughs> like, you know, make it a positive ROI experience, right? So there's a key framework here, right? You start with your ideal customer profile. Who is that? Where do they eat, breathe, drink, and sleep, right? And so you, like, who do they fund? What tools do they buy? Who do they free? Who do they follow? Who are the influencers in the space? Or what events do they frequent? And you try to dominate that sphere. And usually it's like one or two things that work and you keep doubling down. Where it fails is where a lot of founders try to try all kinds of different things. Flavor of the month. Let's go on TikTok. Let's run ads on Instagram. Let's do something on LinkedIn. But there's something to be said about in-person events. And, and that's what a lot of what we did at Boast is we started hosting our own events, going to events and meeting people. And I feel like anytime you incorporate more than two senses, like right now we're sight and sound, but imagine we were in person sitting at a bar doing this, like there's taste, touch, smell, and we're shaking hands or kissing babies or building stronger relationships, right? And you yep. said it right, one deal, you got to figure the ROI. How many people am I going to meet there and what is the ROI? Can I walk away with one solid relationship? So that is, that is brilliant. I want to switch gears here. We're now in 2022. Everyone on the planet has raised tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. How did you build your team, right? Like, how did you navigate this hiring and recruiting in 2022? How did you build your team? And in what order? Yeah, yeah so... Uh... I, I operated and, and Chris and I operated on a really simple philosophy that 
we were always going to fill up our executive table with people who were like experts and way, way smarter than us, right? Like him and I could run sales and success and, and I could run engineering to a point, but eventually to go and recruit great people, the philosophy I always use is like my CTO, Eric, is what every engineer on our team would love to become. My CRO, Steve, is what everyone on our new business sales team would like to become in their career, right? So if I did a great job hiring a great expert, they would you know, hypothetically have a pretty easy time convincing someone they're gonna get exposed to this great expert, right? I had this kind of expert apprentice type of relationship when I got into SaaS, where I just was learning at such an exponential rate from all these experts who are just teaching me everything. So I was like, how do we bring this and scale this kind of expert apprentice type of thinking in the company. And so I started with Eric Alexander, my CTO. I worked with him at Backupify. He was the best engineer I've ever worked with in my entire life twice. You know, infrastructure expert, React expert, Rails expert. I was like, if I could land Eric, at least the product side, we would have half a chance. We're gonna build a super complicated product. I'd have half a chance of surviving. Uh, Andrew Leveroni, my, uh, my now my SVP of product and engineering, like, you know, he had, he had just kind of been a former founder and he had that kind of hustle and intellectual curiosity. And so Andrew took a different path. Like Eric showed up as CTO, Eric, uh, Andrew showed up as like a product manager and kind of, he climbed the ranks into like being director of product, being VP of product. And then, and then ultimately with Eric saying, I want to take more focus on technology, like just running the whole, you know, people side of the engineering function for five years, we've been working together like this, right? And so the three of us, me, Eric, and Andrew have been working together for five years now. And like that, that like triad of the three of us is like really powerful because we have all the context and domain knowledge of all the decisions we made, things we didn't work out. I've been really blessed there. Um, the next executive we hired was my CRO, Steve. And Steve and I had worked at Backupify together, uh, and and he was like, you know, an up and coming uh, up and comer at Backupify. We kind of lost touch for a little while. He went out to a bunch of other companies. He grew really quick in the leadership. He was learning from a lot of masters too. And so then we met. He was ready for his next gig, and we met. And I convinced him that this go to market thing is like we're not we're not even good at doing sales, and we got fifty customers, man. Like. <laughs> Like, imagine if you come in here, you're an expert at this mid-market sale, what you can do. And he was like, all right, I'm in, right? And then, so that was like, okay, we got the engineering leadership. We got the go-to-market leadership, right, in place. Chris and I kind of sweeping up all the other pieces. Um, the the kind of next executives, you know, happened, uh, you know, a, a, a great CMO, someone that, uh, Juliet, someone that I worked with at Backupify also. She was kind of original HubSpot mafia and product marketing expert. And, and uh, Juliet took a little bit longer for me to get, right? And, and, but eventually I kind of always had someone in mind for the role in my network. That was a real key, Lloyd. Like I knew someone in every one of these roles and I'd rather hire someone I knew than someone that was brand new that I don't know. Like I've seen people's careers over like a long arc and Juliet also was in the right part of her career. She had kind of done a VP of marketing gig for three years. And I, I you know, made the ask, hey, you want to come join Steve and I and Eric and, and Chris or get in the back of my band back together? And she's like, absolutely, this sounds amazing. And we had a lot of traction and a lot of, a lot of space for her to operate with. And, you know, then to follow, it was, you know, CFO and, you know, CFO, when you start raising big money and you need, you need that kind of financial controls and the modeling gets a lot more complicated, the gap revenue reporting and all that stuff. And then my, my most recent kind of hire was um, chief legal officer, Tim. He was my customer. He's the general counsel at DraftKings. Uh, he was like, hey, my run at DraftKings was, was, is over now and uh, I've kind of got a good body of work here. I want to do the DraftKings run again from, you know, build a big company. And I said, Tim, you are the you are will be the rock star of Link Squares. You buyer, you are the user buyer, and, and he said, "This sounds great." So you know that was that was a pretty incredible run that we went on together. You know, just kind of there's, assembling the team, all people I know, basically. There's a there's a key lesson here, right? A lot of founders, what they say is, um, you know, they try to look and, and you know write job descriptions and post it on websites. 
But one of the most important things is mapping, doing this mapping exercise of what are the gaps I'm trying to fill and who are people I know and love and respect that I can go and evangelize to take a bet on me, right? And not enough people do that, but you know, life and business is a marathon and it's neither the destination nor the journey, but the companions that matter the most. And if you know somebody and you can find them and evangelize them to join you, they're bringing their passion and their friendship and they're giving it all there. And, and that, is, that is crucial. Now you seem like from our conversation thus far, a phenomenal evangelist. What are some tips, tricks you can recommend to people to evangelize people to join their companies, their missions, to recruit better? Yeah, uh, w- w- someone in, in Boston that I, that I really respect, uh, he, he talks about building your brand. And, and he talks about in this kind of workshop that I went to when we were much uh, younger in the journey, it's like, you know, if you want to uh, convince a, a, you know, a bunch of people to like sail on a ship with you, right? And and the work that's going to require to go and do it, you know, don't, don't talk to them about like, you know, hammers and nails and wood, right. Tell them to, you know, yearn for the open sea, right. Give them a mission to where we're going to head to together. Right. I've always thought about that. Right. Is, is people are going to make a decision to come spend a year, two years, five years, 10 years, that little spot on their resume is going to say link squares and what are they going to get out of it? Right. Well, I'm going to give you more responsibility and more exposure and the ability to build and creatively operate. And that's appealing to some people. It's also appealing, not appealing to other people, right? So for the right people, that is the first thing I've always talked about. Like you're going to have so much responsibility and control. You're going to be able to operate in your own little swim lane. And that's like not every place you have that opportunity. We're definitely onto something. The evidence is clear. We're definitely onto something. We, we, will, we will eventually take over a contract lifecycle management as the number one provider. In, you know, that dream came true in 2021. And we're going to do it together. We're going to have a ton of fun. And you're going to get exposure to your, you know, kind of senior team because we're going to be there working right alongside with you. And you're going to learn so much. It's really been about the learning. Like, what can I do for you, Lloyd? Forget about what you'll do for me. You'll do that for me anyways. Right? But, but it's what I'm going to do for you. We're going to have a ton of fun, a lot of laughs. It's going to be hard, but if, if we can keep doing what we're doing, we're going to get there. We're going to get there faster than you think. But we're going to have to sell and code and ship and market our way out of whatever, right? You know, you want a bigger office? We got to show it in the results. Let's, let's do that, right? You know, one of the things that I, I did also was just kind of evangelize the entire company around what I needed to succeed as CEO. I'm a first timer. I'm a no name. I didn't go to Harvard. I didn't go to Stanford. I'm a nobody. I'm just a guy. I'm just Vishal. Like I'm just this guy. I just exist in the planet, right? No one knows me from a hole in the wall, you know, back in the day. And so I said to myself, I said, well, how are people going to get, you know, take us seriously? I'm going to show up with an ARR chart that you can't deny. You might hate the business and our buyer and who we're going and the competition. But if you look at this graph, you're going to be, it's undeniable that this is not a great company. It may not be your cup of tea to write a check for me or a term sheet, but it's going to be undeniable. And that's how we evangelize. They said, hey, if the chart looks up and to the right with with a lot of pace, the good things will happen. And the good thing is like, I can fill up the bank account. We can keep going. This journey can continue. But if the chart doesn't look like this, we're not going to make it because I don't have anything else to give anyone. I don't have anything else. I'm not a 17 time founder. I didn't you know, work at Google. Like I didn't go to Stanford. I got nothing else to give you all. But if you can help me get this, I think I can do enough to make it keep going year after year. Right. And then just evangelize everyone around the chart. And I say it every day, you know, I train new hires, right. You know, I do some training, you know, some onboarding training. Everyone gets time with me, which is so critical, important to me. Like, we're all responsible for this chart. If you think you're not, you're completely wrong. Every single person in this company is working on this chart. We all contribute. It's not just the sales team. Engineering is so much connected to this chart. If you don't see it, you're in the wrong spot. But that's how we kind of got everyone like rowing as fast and hard as we can 
just rowing in the same direction every day. One of the key things you said there is not what you can do for me, but what I can do for you. That is so important. I truly believe that if you treat your people with love and help them grow, they'll treat your business with love and your business will grow. We're in 2022, the great resignation. People care about purpose and experiences more than just connecting a paycheck. And it's the job of a leader to evangelize that, evangelize people on the mission, the vision, the value, the purpose of the company. And it's not a one and done activity, right? It's, it's like you said, you're doing it day in, day out. Because people who are inspired, motivated, evangelized, excited, they can move mountains. And, and you've showed it with your up and to the right, <laughs> one to 10 million in two years and 160 million in funding. Kudos, man. That is fantastic. So let's get into scaling here. What are some key things people need to do to ensure that they get from one to 10 million and beyond? What are some key things to ensure? And then maybe some key sort of gaps or pitfalls to look out for. You can't iterate and strategize what you don't measure and track. So first get, get a culture of data tracking, especially on opportunities, right? Generated opportunities. Like how did you get the opportunity? Was it a cold call? Was it an email? Did it come through a, a trade show? Like know, know where your, your, your deals are coming from, right? Um, understand data is going to be your friend because it's going to tell you what you have done. It's not going to tell you what you should do, but data is going to help you tell you what you have done. Then you apply your mind and then kind of, you know, figure out the next course corrections, right? Course correct often, but course correct it like one or two degrees, right? If, if cold email is working and trade shows are working, well, you know, do more cold email and go to more trade shows, right? It's not a time to experiment. You can experiment up to 1 million ARR. When you get to 1 million in the ARR, you just keep doing what you're doing. You can mix in some more channels like acquisition channels and kind of different things you want to prove, but don't bet the farm on it. You know, bet the farm on the winners, like the strategy that you've been doing to get to a million ARR. It's the same strategy. You're going to keep doing it until 10. Um, customer success and implementation is really important. Don't discredit it, right? It, and it, and, you know, it obviously varies from, you know, we have a, you know, PLG free trial product with a light box tour and no human ever talks to anyone all the way up to like, you know, we're selling $250,000, very expensive software and it's all human guided, right? Whatever it is, you need to invest in people that have the eyeballs and the time to look at what is going on with the customers, right? VCs, if you desire VC money, are gonna ask you all these questions. Well, where did you find all these customers from? Well, they're actually asking you for like, you know, a group of, you know, grouping your ARR by lead source, right? So you need that answer, right? Oh, how, how did you get all these? Like how, how repeatable is that one channel? Oh, it's super repeatable. We're just sending emails out, man. Like constantly sending emails out, like it's working. Um, and, and then from there, it's like, well, how, why do your customers, why do they buy? What, what, are they, what are they trying to solve? How do they use it? How often do they use it, right? Like um, the, the thing is, is that like as CEO, like let's say you're like my kind of sales process, right? It's, you know, it's a 30K sale. The reps we know take, you know, five months to ramp. So the worst time to start on a, if you're running on a calendar year, January to December, the worst time to start hiring reps is January for the year that you're in, that you need to keep growing. The best time to hire it is five months before that, right? So like every July, we knew this was the case. Every July we would think about, okay, if we end the year at, at 4 million of ARR, then we want to go to 8 million of ARR by the next year. So like, you know, trying to do a hundred percent year over year, which is how you go one to 10 pretty quick. How many reps do we need? How many deals are they going to close? Like, again, you're using data and we start hiring those new hiring classes in July and August, right? We don't start hiring them in January. We start hiring them in July and August so that on January 1st, they're ramped or they've ejected right? And then we've kind of backfilled people quickly. And we kind of overhired on AE class too, right? Like get more hires than you think you need. 
because, you know, you'll start being able to model attrition, you know, by their choice or yours, which is a big part of getting your forecast, right. And, and how many reps you need. And then, and then if you've done it and you've got, you'll get some kind of back end of the year productivity in that kind of Q4 timeframe, then in January, your squad, your new squad is going to be fully ramped with the ability to take you whatever you need, $3 million, you know, new business ARR, and then kind of, that's how we did it. We did it in 18. We had a great 19, right? We did it in 19. We loaded up on reps over the summer. We had a great 2020. And most people didn't have a great 2020, but we just, we had the bench strength. We, we had the ability to power through the uncertainty of COVID. And obviously 2021 was off the charts. Like, you know, we went, we went like seven to 17 million in 2021. Like we did 135% year over year. Like, with the kind of push of the COVID tailwinds and all that stuff. Right. So um, it's been wild, you know, it's been wild to just see this really basic thing, hire the account executives, you know, minus however many months it takes them to ramp. And then if you do it, they're ready to roll and just start the next year climb. Right. I always say we get one day off a year. That's January 1st. Then on January 2nd, we start the climb again. Right. You know, it's, a little depressing, but it's life. You know, we, I chose this life, right? Um, Lloyd, we, we beat our, we beat our, our, our quarter plan. This is our 13th quarter in our row. Last quarter, we beat our plan. That's how you with, do it. With a great culture, a great purpose and great leadership, everything is possible, right? People build companies, not the other way around. And culture is a, is a huge leading indicator of growth. In addition to having a great product and product market fit, I want to circle back to your first 10 paying clients. What level of product readiness did they experience? How did you handle missing functionality, et cetera, in those days? Yeah, it was a repository. We would digitize scan PDFs and we would give you that kind of search engine type of reporting, uh, searching and then being able to drop uh, an uh, output of the report into an Excel spreadsheet. So I would say... 10% of the product that we have now, you know, like 10, 10% maybe of the product experience that people buy today, current. But that one thing was a must have. And then you, you created this repository or backlog of features and prioritized it and shipped it over time. Yeah. We, we would always say the same thing. Well, Hey, I really need this feature like this, that, yeah, you know, it's on the roadmap. Let me see what I can do to kind of move it up. Uh, you know, we're expecting it that it'll be done kind of in the next quarter. And we would call that just-in-time engineering. I'd be like, I, I go to Andrew and Eric, uh, my, my, my generals of the, of the building of the product, I'd be like, hey, what are we building right now? And they're like, I don't know, we got these kind of things we're building right now. I was like, do you think you could push this one off? Because this customer said they'll buy, but we need this feature. And Eric's like, man, I don't know. I could just work, I could just work late tonight. I may be able to put something together in a couple of days. It's like, well, all right, Eric, that'd be great. And like, we just did this just in time engineering. It's, it's terrible. I wouldn't recommend it. You'd have to have the right personalities and the right skill set. but yeah, just in time engineering. And then I'd show back up on a sales call and be like, Hey, great news. You know, talk to our CTO. And this was actually like, I told you in like, you know, beta or like alpha release, you know, I'm able to kind of show you a free preview. We would say that stuff, even though it's hundred percent, not true. Eric just built it like two nights, nonstop till like two in the morning. And I'm like, here, so, you know, it kind of works the way you thought it would. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's great. Okay, cool. You know, I'll have to move forward. And, you know, those were the great kind of banging two sticks together to make fire as hard as we possibly could every single day. So I love it. Just, just in time engineering. How do you prioritize <laughs> what to release today? Oh, I don't do that anymore. No more just in time engineering. So um, we we have a mix of strategic priorities, right? Like uh, we are launching our own signature e-signature product. So like, you know, that's like a strategic priority that needs resources. And then we use customer feedback primarily. We have a great feedback loop between our customer success and implementation team and our product team. They meet every week, they comb through the backlog. Uh, we also get the new business sales team in there kind of, hey, I was selling to this vertical or this industry and they needed this integration that we don't have and it blocked this deal. And so, you know, then we have kind of dedicated product teams like 
we have two products and well, we all, we'll have three products in market, you know, next week, but um, our finalized product, our pre-signature product, our analyzed product with our data science team sharing, supporting both. We have our signature team, then we have our integrations team. And then Lloyd, we have this team that just does quick reaction stuff. We call it customer happiness stuff, like little features that don't need two weeks that you can kind of spend six, seven hours. You know, this button is just not working the way that I needed to, or like, I'm using Microsoft Edge and the, the, this, the app kind of doesn't display right in this table, like, and it makes it hard to use. Just like features that just make our NPS score go higher and, and our customers happy. And they're always so impressed when this quick reaction team jumps on a support ticket or a feedback and they can ship it in a couple of days. And it's kind of the balance between, we can't, we can't do that all the time. We have a small dedicated team that does that. It's also a great training uh, center for us. Like new hires go and rotate on the quick stuff, the quick reaction stuff. They learn the technology, they learn the, uh, the tech stack, they, they learn how we code and how we ship through our development process. And then they can go and they can join and rotate on an, another, um, they can rotate it on a product team. But it's been a, it's been a great strategy. Right. It's been my, my, my engineering leadership is second to none now. It's, it's quite incredible. Love it. Now, you said something important. We're adding a second product. And if you look at it, most companies that are $100 million in revenue or multi-billion dollar companies, they eventually have to add a second and third and fourth and fifth product. Most companies end up becoming multi-product companies, becoming platform companies north of $10 million and maybe much before $50 million. How should founders think about when to add a second product? And how are you making that journey? How did you make that journey? You may need it. You may not need it, right? You, you probably don't need it before a million ARR. Uh, you may need it to 10 million ARR to get there, but I'll tell you that it, it becomes increasingly harder, right? There's so many factors to consider. Like, are you building a product that needs to compete with like salesforce.com? Like, are you building another CRM where the feature list of a mat super mature industry is like, 1700 features for people expect to be inside this thing or are you more like in a category creator where like when you invent a new product it is the world's first product of this kind and the bar the minimum kind of sellable feature set is much lower um i would say that you need to you need to have two teams so when you can kind of hire enough people that you can have two teams or use some sort of outsourced team that kind of splits the priority because, you know, it's like having two kids, right? You're a dad, Lloyd, like me, like, you know, it's like having two kids, they have different priorities, right? You know, my three-year-old and my newborn have different priorities and that's going to be like your product development, right? My, my three-year-old was my analyzed product and my newborn was like my finalized product, right? And they need different care and feeding at different times, which actually splits you apart and, spreads you kind of too thin. You, what you don't want to do is the thing that is selling that's driving your ARR, that always has to be the first priority. That's how you make money. That's how you stay alive, right? You want to add in some other stuff, you've got to probably know that it's going to go slower on the development side because you have something you need to keep going, right? You have something you need to keep going. Um, but then eventually, like, you know, our finalized product is super mature now, but, you know, a good product development from scratch takes a year, you know, it takes a year and a half. And I'd say, release it early, give it away for free, let people use it. That's a lot more valuable than trying to make ARR out of it. And if you just hang in there for a year, you know, a year, 18 months, like two years, it'll, you'll eventually build everything it needs, but you'll let your customers tell you, you know, what were things that are missing that, you know, if you're replacing, rip and replacing another tool, what are things that are missing, right? Um, and have patience, right? Second products, you'll always be frustrated. You know, you'll always be frustrated that it, you know you lost this deal because your second product didn't have three things. God, I wish I had these three things. And that's life. You know, that's the founder's journey. <laughs> that's life. You always, you always got to be a little impatient, but you got to understand it too. Definitely. Now, you know what I, what I'm hearing here is, again, stemming from the customer's problems. What else can you add to extend that and and expand your TAM, but also going through that same journey of validation, getting the product market fit and that in scale versus 
throwing it out there and expecting immediate ARR from it. I like it. Now, let's get into fundraising. Um, you know, the market seems to be cooling off in a big way, but you just closed a $100 million Series C at an $800 million valuation. How should founders think about fundraising and valuations in this environment? Yeah, so if you're like a pre-IPO company, which is what, you know, we get labeled as kind of past the B round, uh, you know, price expectations are probably coming way down from 2011, right? Sorry, 2021. In 2021, the price expectation was really ballooned. And, you know, this is the correction, right? The valuations aren't as high. Companies have to show up with, a, you know, more, much more real business. Now, if you're doing like pre-seed and seed, well, it's probably still pretty frothy, right? You may not be getting 75x ARR or 90x ARR as a valuation multiple, right, for the pre-money. But there's definitely so much capital, right? Um, so, so much capital out there, so much that needs to be deployed, right? Try to show up with more traction, right? Try to show up with more traction. If you thought, you know, hey, I'm going to do a round at 250K ARR, can I do that round at 500K? You know, if I was going to do that round at 500K ARR, can I show up with a million ARR, right? You know, sometimes you need to raise because you need to raise. but there's so much capital that's waiting to be deployed that, um, you know, know your business cold, know your metrics cold, right? Know, know it cold, know why, what's working. The bar to, you know, raise it is probably getting high, higher too, right? And, and it continues to get higher every year. A lot of funds raise a lot of money. They have to deploy it. And they're probably the market cooling off from a public market perspective. It is giving investors a way to negotiate, but still companies with- But investors. lagging, but yeah. really lagging. Like the private VC markets are going to lag, you know, like a fund cycle, right? Yeah. Like people went and reloaded in 2021, raised a billion dollars, raised 400 million bucks, raised $50 million, whatever, right? That's like a, got a 10-year fund commitment, right? And they have to- deploy it out in the first couple of years and wait for the returns in the back half, right? It's 10 years, right? I, I would say like the public markets don't impact, you know, seed stage, comp you know, seed stage investors that much because the liquidity horizon is much longer. They have like 10 years to make those returns back to the people they borrowed money from, right? And yeah, the, the, the pre-IPO companies, B rounds and C rounds and D rounds, the public market is like the next closest step for you you're right there right we're you know if we want to be a public company we're probably two years away three years you know whatever it is it's a lot more scrutiny on me if you're way like earlier in the journey you're gonna it, sh it should be great you know focus on the business know your business inside and out right know why it's working right um but it's gonna lag in a big way it's gonna lag it in the pri private markets but but still the top Top of the market metrics command, top of the market valuations. Like if you're if you're doubling you your ARR, you got it. right? If you have high net revenue retention, which is your revenue minus churn plus upsell, cross sell, and you have high gross margins, what do you think are uh, the key metrics founders should watch? Like a hawk uh, <laughs> going through A, B, C, all the rounds. Yeah. What are the what are the top metrics for you? Yeah. Um... ARR growth year over year percentage, right? And it's infinite. If you can do 100%, great. If you can do 200%, it's even better. You can do 300% in one year, that's amazing, right? Like drive that top line, that's what gets you in the door, right? The chart that looks like this gets you in the door, right? Um, yeah, net revenue retention, net retention is super important, right? If you have a leaky bottom, no matter how much new business you fill in, you can't hold the water in the tank figuratively. It's got a hole in the bottom. You got a high churn problem. High churn scares people away. Um, yeah, gross margin, depending on how complicated your implementation is, you know, you got to watch your cost of goods sold, right? Like COGS is actually a really tricky part of Link Squares that took, you know, took many years to kind of understand and kind of control. And so, but if you don't have a COGS problem and you're operating, you know, in, you know, 90 plus 90% gross margin, that's great. VCs want to invest in software companies, not technology enabled service companies where like humans are doing the work that technology is supposed to be doing. If your gross margins like in the 50, 60, 70, it's going to be pretty hard. Right. So focus on technology there. Um, I, you know, and then also just like, 
you know, NPS, like, is your customer, are your customers happy? Like, are your customers happy? Do you have the data that you measure their happiness? You know, I think the average is 27 or 30 is an NPS score. How do you make it 50? What's stopping you to make it 50 or 60, right? Um, and then burn rate, right? You know, if you've, if you've been fortunate to raise around a capital, a couple million bucks or whatever, like how long is that cash going to last for? You know, the everyone's kind of thinking 18 to 24 months, right? If you burn through $100 million of cash in like six months, like, and you got no, nothing to show for it, like, you know, most likely the journey is going to come to an end, right? The journey is going to come to an end, right? You don't, you, you haven't grown into your valuation, right? Um, the other thing is don't, don't chase pre-money, chase better people, right? Like if you had to trade, and I've done this before, trade five, $10 million on the pre-money valuation to work with a better human that understands you and you vibe and you jive. This is a relationship you can't unfurl. It's like a marriage that you can't get out of. You're your board directors, your investors, right? These are people that are gonna be paramount to your future and what goes on. Always trade better people for lower pre-money if you have to, right? And that's like a big, big thing I've learned, right? I work with so many great people by my own choosing because I said so. Like I'm not forced into, you know, taking money from people I don't want to, and I couldn't get a beer with. I wouldn't go to like a Red Sox game or a Patriots game with or get stuck at an airport for four hours. These are all the things that are intangible. Like, like always choose I agree better 100%. people. Choose I better agree 100%. people. You'll go further. If you optimize for the nth degree on the valuation, the first time a big majority or a major roadblock hits, either they're out of there or you're out of there. If you optimize, always optimize for the relationship, relationships transcend companies. And tell me a little bit more about your fundraise process. What did that look like? Was that a six months process? How did you build the list? How did you work through this journey? This Which round? maybe your B round, maybe your B round, right? Because see, see, probably you had all the buzz. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, or, or, um, or what was what was the hardest institutional round? A for sure, Series A. What I think I went, I went uh, two for seventy-one. I got two term sheets, seventy-one pitches, four trips to San Francisco. All nose, demoralizing, like so hard, really long, hundred and twenty days, running out of money, like. You know, just think I had a, I had a, a newborn at home, like, a, you know, sorry, like a one-year-old at home, like really tough. Like, I didn't know whether we would make it in 2019. I mean, I, I thought we could, but we needed more money. So the A round really hard. So if you're a CEO, your job is to meet as many investors who could possibly do a deal on all the time when it's off cycle. When you're not raising, that's the time for you to go make a spreadsheet, like make a spreadsheet, find people, go to Saster you know, go to your local networks, meet venture capitalists. There's so many outlets, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, there's all these great events all over the country. You know, find where the VCs are, just like you found where the customers are, find where the VCs are in your community, right? You know, it's published somewhere in the city you live in. I know in Boston, it's published everywhere. You know, the pandemic's obviously been harder, right? Um, If you got a little buzz going, people are going to email you. Reach out. Reach out and say, yes, I would love to tell you about the company. I'll spend 20, 30 minutes with you. I'm not fundraising. There's no deck. It's, it's informal. But they're going to ask you questions like, you know, how's it, you know, how's it going? Like, what's your, what's your story? Like, who are you, right? And then you get on their radar. And then, you know, if you want to kind of reconnect with them, you know, in six months, like, hey, Lloyd, you know, I know, you know we met, you know, in January. I'm sure you remember, like, it's July now, and, and I'm, I want to give you a little update about the business. you think they're not going to take that call? Of course they are. The, the VCs are in the business of knowing what's going on behind the scenes. They, and believe it or not, in this financing load, I raised $60 million out of the $100 million, two cold emails, G Squared and G2. G Squared, they're different funds. The names are crazy. But G Squared cold emailed me, and G2 Venture Partners cold emailed me. And then... I ended up being like, hey, cool, let's have a call. We did an intro call. And then I, you know, a month later, I was like, I'm actually going to do this capital raise right now. And then took it into the process. Like the cold email thing is crazy. And take it, make the time. But don't, don't waste time on private equity. Private equity, once you kind of raise your seed round, they'll be all, they'll be like so interested to waste all your time. Like you just got to do two minutes of research. Like, is this a VC fund or is this a private equity group or growth equity? 
like you're way too early for that. That's not kind of the right fit of how you want to spend your time, but um, sift through it, take it, need it. It's your job. You know, try to get 30, 40, 50 funds in your Rolodex that then you email them all when you're like, I'm going to go fundraise. My, I'm ready to raise our next round. You want to chat? I'm starting the process. And then people get in and then good things happen. It's sales. It's pipeline, right? I, I love it. You know, you're running everything like a sales process and, and this is great, right? You fill this pipeline, you build relationships with them. You're telling them about the company. When you're ready to raise, you signal to them. And then, and then you're sending follow-ups like, uh, like a sales call, like you would do after, after a sales call with a prospect, you'd summarize the yeah. call and ask them what you'd like yeah. to see and keep the process going. How do you drive FOMO and a term sheet? Any tactics you've learned from oh. A to C? <laughs> I don't, I don't do that. I'm not that guy. Like I'm like, I don't know. I'm not good enough at it. <laughs> I, I, I follow this really easy philosophy. Like, okay, I'm in a fundraise. I've got the first call set. So uh, let's run the deck. You know, decks are small. You know, mine's 12 charts, 13 charts, 14 charts. It's not big epics. I don't use fancy deck making. I do it all myself in Google slides. Like, um, after the first call, you know, the first call, 30 minutes, we don't need an hour, right? I ask one question, which is like, is this interesting enough for you? Do you want to turn the next card over? And I just wait. And some of them are like, yeah, do you have a data room? You know, we've got historical financials in there. Yeah, I have a data room. Okay, send the data room. Oh, you want the data room? Okay, cool. Like, is that, uh, is that you saying to me, like, you want to turn the next card over? Yeah, yeah, I want to turn the next card over. This is like pretty cool stuff, what you're up to. Cool, okay, yeah, cool. And then it's like, um, when's your partner meeting? Like, what's your process? Then I'd start learning about you. Like, what's your process? And they say, well, yeah, we meet as a partnership on Mondays. And uh, I'm going to go through the data room. You know, let's say I'm talking to them on Tuesday. I'm going to go through the data room Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I may follow up if I have a couple questions, but I'll present this to the team on Monday and kind of, you know, see what they say. And it's interesting when you pitch on like a Monday or you know, you can't pitch on Mondays. Like that's it. Like you have to, you can only pitch on Tuesdays. Like, cause they're in their partnership meeting, like all day looking at deals, you know, typically, you know, if you pitch on a Tuesday, it feels like forever for Monday. But when you pitch on a Thursday, you kind of were like, Oh, well, they already got back to me. Oh, they must be interested. Right. Like, um, and then, yeah, they come back and then if they start asking questions and, you know, it's like, they're just learning more and, and questions are good. It's on you to turn them around really quick, right? You got to turn do you them go around. And say, do you go and say like, hey, I have a term sheet or I'm expecting All right, a term yeah, let's sheet go. by this yeah, let's, let's go to the end. Let's go to the end. Okay, so we're done with diligence, right? You know, there's the initial call. There's, we're in initial diligence. I've sent the data room. They're asking questions. I'm bringing in my, you know, executives, like my CRO, my, my you know, CMO, whatever. And then the, we're done with that. We've answered all the questions. Then we're just waiting. So then I email them again. It's like, hey, I'm like, you know, just let's sync up. Like, let's sync up. Or on the, I'm on the back of a two-hour diligence call. I kick everyone off. And I'm like, hey, where are you in the process? Just like learning. Like, where are you? What are you doing? And then if they kind of ghost you, you know, I always send the same email. It's like, it's like subject line, like, what's next? Question mark. Like, hey, Lloyd, uh, you know, I thought we had some good chats, but, you know, we got a bunch of other conversations going. and you know, do we have a next step or is it, you know, are we done? Like, do we have a next step or not? Like, just like, let me know either way. Give them a chance to break up with you. It's just like sales, like a long drawn out no that started from a maybe is a complete waste of time. Someone who just says no on the first call, I'm very appreciative of that. I have a very limited amount of time. It sucks when you're like really kind of, you don't know a lot about capital raising, but they're actually doing you a huge favor. The long maybe no just drains your soul. Um, and then, yeah, you need, you need the first person to give you a term sheet. So you're just waiting for the lead. You're trying to work them all in parallel as hard as you can. Then one person's like, we're really excited, Lloyd. Here's a term sheet, man. We're so excited about both what you're up to and what the future looks like. Here it is. Then you email everyone that's like, I have a term sheet in hand. And if you want to talk about doing something, we need to talk today. And then they're going to say the same thing. You know what? We discussed, we rounded up. Congratulations. We rounded up. It's not the right fit for us. I'm out of here. Okay, great. Sounds good. 
Perfect. I'm so happy that you said that. I don't have to waste another minute on you. And then other people will be like, okay, yeah. So like, how's the term sheet? You never say who it's from. Like you never say who it's from. That's for me to know and for you to, you know, find out in the press release if you don't do this deal. Like, um, I'm like, yeah, you know, it's at the you know price that we wanted. And, you know, it's, you know, raising the amount of money I told you. And I was like, so what about you? Like, what are you going to, what are you going to do? And they're like, yeah, cool. You know, we're going to put a term sheet together. Okay, man, TikTok, you know, don't have an infinite amount of time. These term sheets don't last forever. You know, I got to do what I always say the same line. You got a job to do. I got a job to do. You know, it's like, I got to do what's best for the company. You know, I can't wait around 17 weeks for you to write me a term sheet. Like, you know, when are you going to give it to me? It's like, okay, I'm going to give it to you tomorrow. Okay. Well, if tomorrow comes and goes, you told me everything I need to know. You know it's like, I don't, you know, it's like, I was just pretty straight up, you know, no games, no games. Right. You know, there's, there's a couple of things here. Controlling the pace, bringing people along in parallel at the same time. So you're not getting term sheets or like you're not bringing people along at different times. So you, you said that that is, that is a great one. And then giving people the opportunity or the reason to say no. It's, you know, so many people just hang on for dear life thinking hope is not a sales strategy, right? <laughs> you, if it's get, not a fundraising people, strategy either. <laughs> in one of people my- to say no. One of my mentors, one of my mentors said to me, you want to learn about fundraising? Let me teach you. Let me teach you it. Okay. If you looked at the most beautiful woman crossing the street, and if I said to you, Vishal, describe her to me, but you can't use anything about her physical personal, uh, physical traits, and you can't talk to her. How do you know that she's beautiful? He's like, dude, it's happening up here. It's chemical. It's happening deep inside your brain. Like at a level you can't synthesize if I don't give you words. And that's like fundraising. Like if you walk into a VC's office, it's visceral, it's chemical the day they meet you. And if it's not chemical, it's never going to be chemical. It's just never going to be chemical. They're never going to get there. But, but I've had these chemical moments happen five times now where it's just like, Oh yeah, you know, there's a little rough edges in the company, like every company, but they see it. They see it. They're they're excited. You can hear it in their tone, their demeanor, their body language. They're, they're all over it. It's it's a firing so deep inside your brain. It's like firing so deep inside their brains that they it they're just telling you everything they need to tell you without even talking to you. Right. And the way they're talking to you is like they're they're following up, they're on time, they say they're gonna do something tomorrow, they do it. And and the thing that drags people down in fundraising is like, you think it's chemical and they don't want anything to do with you. It's like, you know, you think it's really chemical, but you're not being honest to yourself. And now it's funny. My whole exec team knows the chemical thing. And then we get off like a call and they're like, it's chemical. I'm like, I know it's chemical. It's going to happen. Like, just keep going. Everyone keep going. It's chemical. Right. Cause 100%. it's happening deep inside. You know, it's and when something is going to happen, conversations like the messages and the flow of messages and the communication intensifies and intensifies. And if, if, if there's like long gaps, like unfortunately ghosting and time kills all deals. Right. Um, we're way past the top of the hour. Great, great, great conversation. Audience is super engaged. I'm going to take the last few questions in rapid fire, and this is going to make for a phenomenal podcast episode as well. So lots of great content. I think we can go for hours. I'm going to invite you to speak at our IRL conference in Vancouver in August. We've got a solid lineup from Atlassian to all the major oh, thank you. C-suite. Thank you so much. This, thank you, Lloyd. This, 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 so this, this, this has been great. But, you know, as you look back, what was the toughest or lowest point of your journey and how did you navigate it? Uh, right, right. As I was in diligence from uh, the series a, uh, there was a mistake on our income statement. Uh, and it, and it was a mistake with a vendor invoice that was being binned as R and D when it needed to be binned as gods. And it was something that I missed. And it's not the person who was running finance for us at the time. She's the absolute best human being on the planet. Like the nicest person you ever meet. And made a mistake on an in, in, income statement, an honest mistake, not not like Theranos, you know, wire fraud. <laughs> like it was an honest to God mistake. We used one vendor for multiple things, R and D and Cogs activities, and it would all we all mistakenly got binned as R and D, 
and then our gross margin was actually way worse than than it, I thought it was. And um, that was the lowest point of the journey when we we had a term sheet in hand, and I didn't know whether this, you know, I didn't know whether we would keep it because the financial kind of underpinning was wrong, and I I didn't sleep for three or four days waiting to hear back, you know, like waiting to hear back. And finally, we heard it was all clear and, you know, the, the impact was minimal, but I didn't sleep. I didn't eat. I couldn't think. I had insomnia. I was pacing around my house and I was so upset at myself. Like I was so upset at myself that I, I let this thing happen and it's all on me. You know, I, I would never, ever point the finger at anyone else. That's being the leader. Right. You never point the finger at someone else when it's like a mistake like that. I was just like, it's me. I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. Like, you know, here's the real data. I worked all weekend, like figuring it all out, how it happened. It's a God, honest to God mistake in Bill.com, like the way we use Bill.com or whatever back then. And I learned a really valuable lesson. Like, you know, you are what the spreadsheets say you are. And the spreadsheets better be 100.0% accurate at all times. Then I hired a great CFO. He's built an amazing financing. That person still works for me and she's the absolute best. We love her to death. And, you know, it was like a story I don't even even know if I told her. You know, it's like one of those moments where you got to own it. And that was a real low point, but we got through it. And and it's like, I never want that that to ever happen again, right? You know, we never want that to ever happen. That was a real hard, hard moment. The hard moment on the journey. Buck stops with the CEO, man. And, and you know what, that's, that's the way to do it. It's, it's always the fault of the CEO and you got to own it and uh, you can only control what you can, but I can't recommend this enough. I had a lot of OF moments during our series A as well, a lot to do with financials because you were running a scrappy startup and I can't say strong enough, find a CFO. It's going to make all the difference fractional part-time i mean they don't need to make 400k on your payroll like you know fractional three hours yes. 10 hours but get your models right get your income statement right do your gap right bring them on the fundraise if you're not an accounting expert don't answer a bunch of accounting questions on the fundraise like you're not an expert you'll look like a complete idiot like and never ever do your financials incorrectly make sure you do them at 100% precision <laughs> Your, your whole fundraise is based on that decision. And these little mistakes, there's a fine line between like looking like a mistake and a fraud eventually, right? And so you yeah. got to, you got, these things kill your credibility. And I can't say this enough, hire that fractional CFO. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, and last and question double here. check. And, and I also say, Lloyd, double check the way you calculate the core SaaS metrics. Like, are, did you do your net retention correctly? Like, did you include, did, are you overinflating your net retention with customers that are in multi-year agreements? Like you're going to get caught on all this stuff. You know, it's like, make sure you do the metrics correctly. Be honest about them. Honesty is the only way to do it. Go ahead, man. Sorry. Sorry. I cut you off. Like no, you no, said, no, no. we could go for hours. No, we get, we, we have another couple of minutes here, but um, so you guys were a tech enabled business that, that then made the software journey or like, because when we, when you talked about gross margin, you said, Hey, that, that was no, a bit of a challenge. No, no, just, no, we've, we've always been like a web application is just, we got into a scenario where we just, we closed 124 logos in one year and we closed like 60 in like 30 days. And that put like this kind of cogs load that the way that we were doing implementation couldn't scale. Like it wasn't ready to scale. It actually did the opposite of scaling. It took off from the launch pad and turned back down to earth and blew up. Like, you know, it was like that moment where like this part of the business is, is broken that it needs more optimization. So no, I mean, we had kind of been like a, you know, upper 80, low 90% business and it took a big dip. I mean, it's just like, you're the product of your own success. You go one to 4 million in one year you do, you do 124 logos. There's like 12 people in the company. It's like on fire everywhere constantly. Like you're just trying to hang on. Like you said, you know, you're just trying to hang on for dear life. Right. And, and that's when I knew like, you know, this thing was going to go hot and heavy, but you know, we needed to start thinking ahead now, six months ahead. Like, Hey, if we do 250 logos one year, what's going to happen? Well, okay, well, you're going to fix all this, get out ahead of it. It's your job as CEO, right? I live just in the future now. 
What goes on Customers this quarter? Are- what goes on this quarter? Someone already figured it out. Like they're running this plan we thought of a year ago. I think of what's going on next year, and the years after that. that I mean, that's my job now. Definitely. Our customers happy? Our employees happy? Is there cash in the bank? <laughs> those, those, are, those are key things. And get stay, out of the way. Of that. Hire, a bunch of, get, hire a bunch of experts and get out of the way. <laughs> and and just, just watch those key things. Uh, what's the one piece of unconventional advice founders you talk to typically ignore but shouldn't? There's a, there's a, lot, more, there's a lot more than you think about not giving up. It, it, goes, it goes a lot further than you think like like if you don't give up you're more likely to succeed but most people are like this is too hard and oh, i'm going to give up and this thing failed but giving up is actually worth a lot more than you think it is not giving up sorry not giving up is worth a lot more than you think it is. anything good takes a long time to build i had a Jason Lemkin's been a mentor of mine. He gave us a free boot for Boast at, at Saster in 2017. I just had him on the show a few weeks ago. And he said, it takes a lot of effort to get to 10 million. But once you get to 10 million, and unless you have some massive founder issues, why sell? Because he sold, um, right? He sold early. And today, Adobe eSign is doing billions in revenue. And when, when he sold EchoSign, you know, he, he sold early and he says, as a founder to build another company and take it to 10 million is hard. What better thing you have to do for another five, 10 years than to take this thing from a 10 million to hundred million in revenue. Why not persevere? Even if you're growing at 50% year over year, it may take you 10 years to get to hundred million. And so, so that is, I think the key learning here as well is anything good takes a long time not giving up is worth a lot. Such a pleasure, man. Thanks for joining us. Would love Thank to you, see Lloyd. you at Traction. Amazing. Would love to see you. Would love to see you at Traction in Vancouver. I'm going to send you our t-shirt that says, I love it when you talk data to me. Love and peace, man. Have a great weekend. I need some traction.